Hello, 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 and welcome to another awesome episode of the Collective Spotlight. Um, I'm super happy for my guests today. I reached out to them right when I FOC'd the book. Um, it is Patrick, who is the writer of the book Siphon through Top Cow Image Comics, however you want to call it. But Patrick, thank you so much for joining us today, man. Um, oh, yeah. Great to, uh, great to, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. This book, from the moment I read the solicit as I was doing my orders, just like, just blew my mind. The whole idea, like the guy can can kind of take uh, people's pain or whatnot, mm -hmm. and, and he's an EMT, so that kind of works hand in hand. Um, but you know, rather than me butchering it, <laughs> you want to go ahead and tell people actually what they can expect on Wednesday when Siphon Number One comes out on uh, shelves. Sure. So uh, Siphon is basically about this guy named Silas who is an EMT, as you said, and he's uh, he has some kind of like uh, personal demons in his past, so he's been living a very just focused on helping people, you know, doing his job, which is a, a tough job dealing with a lot of people who have a lot of kind of pain, you know, and, and are not in good situations. So he uh, kind of stumbles upon is gifted with this power where he can perceive people's like emotional pain and siphon it from them. And at first he's like, wow, this is an amazing ability because I can help all these people. But as it goes on, he kind of realizes like it, it's hard to spend every day walking around seeing people who are kind of, you know, on fire metaphorically and knowing you can put it out. But the more of this pain he takes on, the more it kind of weighs on him and, and stays with him. Um, so the, the book, as it goes on and, and in this first issue, as you'll see, is kind of exploring this question of how much of kind of like the, the negative negativity of the world, the pain of the world can you take on? to yourself before you destroy yourself. So it's it's a little bit, uh, you know, obviously we're not trying to spoil anything, but it's a little no. bit of a monkey's paw situation where mm. it's like he has this this blessing kind of at first, and then he finds out how it turns into a curse a little bit, right? Yeah, I think it's something that is, you know, it's both good and bad. And I think it's something that can be relatable to people because I think we all, you know, see see hard things going on in the world and terrible things in the world and you want to help. But I think we've all seen in the past, you know, year, few years, how people, you know, friends of yours or whatever might be just like, you're kind of like you have to disconnect at some point, like you can't take everything onto yourself. Um, so it's about kind of, how could he find that balance before it just starts to, you know, destroy him? Um, and I think it's it's kind of a, a mix of like a very real world sort of, you know, urban setting with a more kind of fantasy uh, undercurrent. And, and as the series goes on, you kind of find out more about the origins of this power and it kind of opens up this mythology that, you know, we, we explore a little bit and okay. in the, over the course of this series, but definitely if we were to do a, a second series, we have all kinds of ideas of, you know, there's a lot more that you're not going to see in the book. So it's, it's kind of like you're scratching the surface. Um, I, I always compared the, the series to kind of like the first star Wars movie where you're like, if, if you just watch that one, that's it. Like there's uh -huh. stuff hinted at, but it's a complete story. It's over. But then, you know, in the future, who knows if, if it's a success, we might come back and, and tell more and build out the universe more, hopefully. Yeah. I mean, you just like set me up for like my next three questions. I now know oh, nice. which, <laughs> which one I want to go with first. But uh, first of all, um, what, because like you said, it's kind of a grounded story while also hmm. putting in some fantasy and superhero type things. Um, what was your motivation to, to kind of write and create um, this this story, you know, what had you? Yeah. What were your, you know, uh, your influences growing up in terms of mm -hmm. comics and pop culture, and then kind of what what influenced this? So uh, I'm working on the book with uh, Mosin Ashraf, who's my co-writer, and I he kind of came up with the initial premise of a guy who could of the the power essentially, and then we built it out together and kind of built out this whole mythology. So I, I think for me. Um, Having done like a documentary about Neil Gaiman, I, I always think about um, he talked about like Neverwhere. His book was kind of the idea that you have this regular world going on around you, and then there's a whole hidden, like uh, under the surface thing happening. So, so I always like that idea where it's kind of like if you you know walked around the, this corner in your city, you might stumble into this uh, kind of you know struggle and things that's going on, and it, it's something that it's not it's not a fantasy that's apart from us. It's a fantasy that's in our world and very grounded. And I think for me, as we were coming up with the story, it was very much 
looking at this metaphor because I think a lot of you know we see a lot of like movies that are like if you just fight for the right thing everything will be great and mm -hmm. like we we did it you know and, and I don't think that's how it is in the real world I don't think it's a question of either like you're fighting for something or you're empathizing with people or you're not I think it's a question of you know how how much how can you balance like living your own life and and you know doing things that that make you happy or appreciating what you have with like the fact that there is so much trouble in the world and it's like there's always the you know there's always going to be trouble and, and in many ways you know in some ways it's like we live in the, the greatest time to be alive because it's like we have access to you know food and shelter and, and you know most not everybody but like most people do and a it, it, hundred anybody from like a hundred years ago 150 years ago would be incredibly jealous of, <laughs> of me or you you know they you wouldn't be like a they'd be like a bathroom oh my god like heat air conditioning Running water oh my god like yeah yeah so so in some ways it's like the greatest of times and then in some ways it can feel terrible because you're like oh you know there's all this uh, division and the climate change and all these crises um so it's it, it's kind of like exploring these questions of how do you deal with that fact that there is so much uh, struggle in the world and, and find a, a balance um and i i always love things that are you know um, diving into kind of like a complex or, or especially with genre where it's not like you're literally making a book about these issues, but mm -hmm. you're doing it in kind of a, a, a metaphorical way. I, I think it's interesting. It gives you a little more leeway, I think, to engage in like the, the complexities uh, of cool. something than if you're talking about it. I know like, um, for example, like I, I always felt like Battlestar Galactica was the best exploration of like a post 9-11 um, society because it didn't have to be accurate you know mm -hmm. it didn't have to literally dramatize facts it could dramatize the feelings and I, I think that's kind of what we're trying to do with this uh, absolutely and I actually I'm glad you you described it the way you did because I was kind of as you started at the beginning I thought to myself um, the whole siphoning power is probably something a lot of very kind-hearted people you know in this mm. world right now actually wish they could have you know we all yeah. kind of when we see somebody suffering, I think a lot of us sometimes think, man, I wish I could do something. I wish I could mm. do something. And you've kind of written in this, like you said, little fantasy world, but based in a lot of grounded life, a tale of somebody that actually can do that. And then yeah. again, you're kind of writing the ups and downs of being able to, to be that hero slash. Yeah. Hero. And I think sometimes we, we do get to see him really using it in a way that, that, you know, improves the world and, and helps these people. And I think that, you know, it, it's not, it, it's kind of like dealing with all these these questions and things, um, you know, and, and that's just the first issue. So in, in the later issues, kind of it, it gets a little more complicated and we see some new layers of what he can do. And he has some more kind of like challenging choices about what what to do with this power as he kind of un, unravels new areas of its uh, ability. Well, and you mentioned earlier um, how the story will kind of unravel over the course of the three issues that are solicited. Yeah. Um, but then you also kind of touched on that if, you know, things go, you know, well, th there's more to the universe potentially. Um, you yeah. guys currently have it written. Like you said, it's a three issue arc, uh, very yeah. much like the first Star Wars that you can watch it and, and feel yeah. satisfied. But you do, you, you, you kind of do have openings in the back of your mind of like where you can take the story after that third issue. Definitely. I, I think, you know, uh, obviously we'll, we'll have to see exactly what happens, but the, the, we're hoping and i think the plan is to to come back for another one and um we're breaking out the story now but i, I think it might be a little bit of like a, a kind of a godfather part two flavor where there's some elements in the past and there's a story in the present um and kind of uh so so the main other character in the story is this guy named antonio that silas encounters um who's kind of teased at the end of the first issue and um, in the later issues uh, comes to more prominence, but he is somebody who has some insights into this power and its history uh, and it, that raised a lot of questions uh, for Silas. And I, I think he's kind of, um, it's kind of a, a, a like Magneto-esque figure okay. in that he's like, a, you know, uh, he's saying things that are, you know, they don't sound great, but then you think about it and maybe there's, there's a kernel of something <laughs> there, but, you know, but it's not great, but maybe. So um, I always love that kind of villain who's kind of an ambiguous villain or a very like charismatic and, um, you know, a villain who, who has you, you feel like I can understand this person. Yeah. Um, are they even a villain? You know, so that, that's kind of the thing um, in the later issues of the series uh, we see. So let me ask you, cause uh, I've had a lot of independent creators on the show. Mm -hmm. um, 
a lot of, I feel like the consensus is between a four and a six issue miniseries is where a yeah. lot of writers feel like they can really flesh things out. Yeah, um, yeah. We're going with three, which traditionally seems like it makes a ton of sense because it's literally beginning, middle, end. Mm. Um, now, did you find, was three the way that you wanted to, to write it out or did you kind of have to cram a little bit into, into three? Um, no, I, I think I, I'm always a fan of, um, like I love, you know, many comics of today, but I, I always do like how in like Sandman or, or even going back to like, you know, Claremont's X-Men, they would, each issue would feel substantive. So like mm -hmm. Days of Future Past is a two issue story. So like if they can do that in two issues, I, I think I can tell this story in three without it, you know, necessarily being as like packed with text yeah. as that. But I, I, I love how, I mean, Sandman, there's so many single issues, I think that were just like, you know, you look back and you're like that, that, you know, whatever, like Hob Gadling or the, the one in Rome or, or what have you, like where you're like, that was 20 pages and it really told a story and it had a theme and, and things like that. So I, in, in the each issue, I think we sort of have a little bit of a different story and a little bit of a, a different theme or, or issue that's being explored. Um, and I, I like that challenge. I think for the next one, we would maybe consider four. Um, but you know, I, I think we, we kind of broke this story with, with the three specific, um, pieces that are all very e each distinct, even as they, you know, tell one story and layer on each other. So, so, uh, <clears throat> because I have you on the show, I always like yep. to, to tell people kind of how it's, how I'm hearing about the book already in the store. Yep. Um, literally before I came to interview you, I had like three customers call to ask for siphon to be dropped in their box. Uh, oh, that's amazing. Wednesday. That's so great to hear. So it's nice to see that the book is getting a lot of legs already. Um, yeah. how, how has it been for you? You know, I know it was in Diamond Solicitations a few uh, yeah. months ago. It was on FOC last month. And now you're finally on the week of release. What has it been mm. like for you of, of having this book go through the, the ringer to be I, finally released? I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I have to praise. Um, I, I think a lot of it is just due to, to Jeff Edwards, who's the artist and like, you know, it, it, sometimes I think as a writer, you're kind of like, you know, let me just get an artist who's like not going to hurt the book mm -hmm, and can just mm -hmm. like deliver a story. And now I'm kind of like, wow, he's the star of this thing. And I'm just like, let me give him something to work with. Because <laughs> I, I think he's like, you know, obviously having worked with him, I've, I've had insight by think he's I, I was like, it's like if Mark Silvestri met J.H. Williams, like he can do different styles and we mm -hmm. see in in a little bit in the the first issue a kind of like uh, more sort of like a classic image type very you know dynamic action style and then he has a little bit of a softer brush type of look and especially in the later issues uh there's a lot of kind of like experimental layouts and things mm -hmm. that are you know using the double page spread and using like surreal imagery and i think he just really flourishes with it um and I, I know, like, having shown the cover around, people are just like, damn, I love that cover. And I'm like, oh, me too. Um, so I, I think Jeff has done a great job. And, you know, it is a visual medium. So I think um, it's very, like, important to have a visual uh, presence in the book. And he's just, like, delivering it in a, in a great way. And I, I think it will jump out when it's on the shelf, you know. And, and you mentioned the cover, but also I think your trade dress uh, logo mm. was actually really cool because – um, obviously you were going with like the, the O was a siphon, siphoning, but yep. you guys didn't just, uh, agree to just do that with the O. It kind of does the whole logo in there. Yeah. I actually thought it was phenomenal. I know it's a tiny thing, but for me being in the comic store, the trade dress is huge. So no, well we taught that's uh, Vince Longo uh, at Top Cow designed that. And we talked a lot about the O and how it kind of like crisscross, you know, like mm -hmm. lines around each other. So it's great to hear that. Like you noticed it because it was something that we were, you know, going back and forth on it, refining, I think he did an amazing job with it. Um, I just got my books today, uh, so I saw it, you know, in print for the first time, mm -hmm. and it looked great, and I was just was always exciting to see that, you know. And, and you mentioned Top Cow, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know how many of our, our uh, viewers know that Top Cow is technically within the, the image umbrella and everything. Yep. Talk to me a little bit about what it's been like working with Top Cow and, and Henry, who's a great guy mm -hmm. who actually helps set this up, but oh, what's nice. it been like working with them? Yeah, well, Henry uh, is my uh, friend for a while. We, we go way back. Um, I, uh, out in, he first came to LA actually to work on a movie I was doing and then now has risen up to become, you know, a, uh, a, a fixture of the comic scene here and, you know, abroad, uh, 
in the rest mm-hmm. of the country, et cetera. Um, so I, I think Top Cow has been great. I mean, Matt Hawkins, I think, has you know been in the business for for a really long time and has great instincts. And we talked, um, you know, we had we talked a lot about the story with him as we were kind of getting into it, and he gave some great ideas that I think really helped hone. You know, because I think every early outline or anything of a story mm-hmm. kind of has a lot of like w- rough edges where you somebody who can come in with an objective view and say, why don't you just, you know, get to the point and, and streamline it a little bit. So I think he helped a lot with that and um, really like conceptualizing the character and, and making the story something that was very direct. Um, and, and it's just been great. I mean, they uh, Matt have met Jeff at a con in like February of 2020. So like one of the last cons to happen before COVID and he, he brought us Jeff and he was like, you got to use this guy. Like he's great. Um, you got to use this guy. And he was telling a story about how him, um, he was at this con and Eric Stevenson from image was there and he was talking with Eric and he was like, Oh, did you see any good, uh, you know, cause I, everybody brings the portfolios and he was like, mm-hmm. you see any good portfolios? It's like, ah, I only saw one guy. And Matt was like, Oh yeah, I only saw one guy. And then they were like, Oh, same guy. So, um, <laughs> uh, so, so the, I think bringing that and, and just like, you know, it, it's kind of cool to have the, the reach of image comics, but a little bit more of a boutique flavor. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and I think image, sometimes it can be a little hands off because it, 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 it just due to the nature of the business, it's about the freedom. So I think top cow is nice because you get, you know, somebody to bounce things off of and, and a little bit more of, um, you know, a, a hand when you need it without yeah. being overbearing <laughs> on you. It's a little bit of a, like a smaller team in that Mm. sense that there's more people there. The people are a little bit closer. You feel more comfortable with asking guys like Henry, you know, for help. Definitely. Definitely. And they've been great with, you know, getting us press and getting us out there. Um, and, And I think it's, it's cool with, you know, stores coming back and things coming back, you know, to be doing, uh, I'm doing a couple of signings this week here in LA and I know, um, uh, Mosin is actually in London and he's doing Forbidden Planet London, which is exciting. Ooh. So we're, we're spanning the globe here as we uh, get ready to launch, you know, the book, which, which is cool. Nice, man. And I'm super excited for you. Cause again, like from the moment I read the solicit mm. at FOC, I was just like, Ooh, need this guy. And actually I think it might've been Henry had posted in the final order cutoff mm. uh, group at first. And I was like, Oh, this solicit sounds fire. You know, nice, and, nice. Um, I can always, appreciate a publisher who does just one cover because it makes yeah. my job easy because i just order a ton of that one and i put it in everybody's box but yeah yeah you guys made this a really easy experience by having what i feel like is a quite an original story you know especially mm. in a time where uh there's a i don't want to say that anybody is being unoriginal but there's yeah. so much content on the shelves yeah you, people tend to step on each other's toes every once in a while and i think this is very original has a really great feel for it um when I read the solicit, I also see like they they go ahead and credit you as comic comic documentarian. Mm. Uh, so I know you've mentioned that you've worked on some Neil Gaiman stuff, like doing some documentaries for that. But what is so? Uh, explain to our people who might be being introduced to you the first time what it is other than comics that you have done. Sure. So I um, am you know a longtime comics reader, and I, I'm a huge fan of. Uh, people like, you know, the, the kind of Vertigo era mm-hmm. writers like Grant Morrison, Neil Gaiman, etc. So about 10 years ago, uh, or a little bit longer now, I um, pitched Grant. Uh, I had written all these uh, blog posts about the Invisibles when I was in college. So I was just like, oh, I got, I, I had a job sitting like in a computer, monitoring a computer <laughs> lab. So I, I had a, a lot of time sitting on a computer. So I was like, oh, this would be a fun project. I'll, I'll write up each issue. And then I got approached um, by Mike Phillips uh, of Sequart Publisher, and it was like, "Oh, we want to turn these into a book about the Invisibles." I was like, "Oh, that's super cool. Let's let's do that." And I was like, "Oh, what if we pitched Grant on doing a, a documentary profile, or, or like an interview on video?" Mm-hmm. Since since that was kind of the the you know my day job or whatever you yeah. want to say is is working in film and, and uh, editing and production and things. So. Uh, we reached out at, to him and Kristen, and then they were like, yes, let's do that. And um, so we made Grant Morrison Talking with Gods, which is uh, it's on Amazon Prime, I believe now. It's on YouTube. Um, it's on many platforms. Look it up. Uh, you can watch it for free. Um, and it was like – it was a great experience because I got to meet not only Grant but many of the – you know collaborate with people like Karen Berger and other, you know, Phil Jimenez, many, many 
comics industry figures and I went to like San Diego Comic Con for the first time. Um, and it was really cool because I'd been to cons as, you know, uh, more on the fan side and mm -hmm. then to go on, on the pro side was very exciting. And I think it gave me a lot of cred to say like, oh, I'm doing this movie about Grant. People were like, okay, this, this guy's legit. Um, so then from there I, I went on, uh, that was a success and, and we went on to make um, a doc on Neil Gaiman called Dream Dangerously, which was fun. We followed Neil around his uh, big book signing tour, which was like his last uh, book signing tour. Um, and he's done some signings since, but but nothing on this scale. So we went all around yeah. England. So it was fun um, traveling with him for like two weeks and really getting, you know, uh, in the zone and, and getting to spend a lot of time with him and, and see him at work and, and uh, you know, dive into his world. So that, that was a fun project. That's on Amazon Prime as well now. Um, should be. Uh, you can look it up. If it's not there, yeah, it looks um, like all of them were on Amazon, Tubi, and on yeah, Tubi. Service. So, um, yeah, so they're they're out there. Um, and then along the way, I did a few other projects. I did a doc on Chris Claremont, who is a, a favorite writer of mine, one of the first people who got into me into comics. And I, I think it's been really cool because when I was doing the doc, I was kind of like, it's crazy how underappreciated he is because mm -hmm. like he, he created like everything that is X Men is him, you know. And I don't think people really realized how how important he is. And I think in the past few years, we've seen a little bit more of kind of like a, a, a renaissance in appreciation of his work and people talking about it. Um, and I hope that the movie was a part of that. Um, and I also did a project on image, which was how I first met Matt called The Image Revolution, um, which was really fun. I went around and we interviewed all the founders and Rob Liefeld and Todd and Jim Lee. And um, that's just, it's such a crazy story. It's kind of like a, you know, the social network in comics uh, in the nineties with the, the nineties nostalgia is also really fun because you get to see all the, the crazy, you know, outfits of the nineties and the fans <laughs> who are freaking out and stuff. You get to see Rob doing an underwear ad. You or, know? Yeah, he does his uh, button fly jeans uh, <laughs> yeah. spot. So that, that was a really fun thing. It's cool for me because um, a, a lot, they talk about like Golden Apple. They have signing a Golden Apple and like Easy e came and Gene Simmons came. Yeah. Uh, so we're doing a signing for, or I'm doing a signing uh, if, at Golden Apple for this book. So I'm kind of like, oh, wow, it's like an official, you know, Image Comics thing. Uh, it's really cool. Um, and that was a fun, you know, it's, it's fun to hear them all and to kind of like have gone around and be like, oh, Rob said this. What do you think about that? And then, the, you know, uh, some of the the old you get to see all the the, the ups and downs and things of, of this crazy journey uh, So that was a really fun project and then I also worked with uh, Marissa Stodder and we did a project that I helped produce called she makes comics which was about Basically after doing image people were kind of like oh are there any women who are involved in comics and I was like oh you know there are a lot but um you know, that would be an interesting story. And then we worked together and we uh, kind of traced the history of comics by focusing on the, the women who were involved. So nice. it was exciting for me because, you know, people like Karen Berger or Anne Nocenti who edited X-Men in the what I think is like the best era of X-Men or Louise Simonson who edited X-Men and wrote alongside Chris, uh, you know, uh, up to the present day with people like Gail Simone or Kelly Sue or, or even the next generation of kind of, you know, web comics type people. So that, that was a great project yeah. as well and a lot of fun. That's really cool. And I love two things I love about that. Well, actually, a ton of things I love about that. A, I'm a big documentary nut. Um, hmm. You will find me wasting hours at night on <laughs> YouTube going down the rabbit hole of why did this fail and why did this succeed? So yep, like, yep. I love the fact that you are, you know, you were listed as the editor and director on some of those. Yep. So it's like really cool that you were involved with that. Yeah. I also love how your image thing went full, kind of full circle because you did a doc on them and now you're kind of publishing a yeah, book. Yeah, so, so it's really exciting for me, definitely. And, you know, um, it's fun because I know Matt from kind of the, the, his historical journey and context of having started at, at Extreme with Rob Liefeld and then having moved to Top Cow and um, you know he's just uh, he had a funny story of getting into comics where he was like I had never read a comic and I took my like uh, nephew or something to a signing and then I was just like can I have a job and Rob was like okay <laughs> and it kind of you know from there it's, it's been a crazy journey so it, it's fun to know that and obviously getting to work you know, have Mark Silvestri involved and, you know, we did a, a Comic-Con at home panel with mm -hmm. Mark and he was excited about the book and that was so cool since, you know, his his X-Men back in the day what is such a, you know, iconic run. His X-Men with Grant is iconic, his early image work. You know, I, I think as a 
everybody we interviewed was kind of like Mark was the best artist of the image yeah. founders. And, you know, you can certainly, uh, you know, argue uh, yourself about that. But I, I think it's pretty indisputable how, how well, influential, uh, you know, he is. You couldn't pick up a, a book from that era, you know, late 80s to 90s without seeing his name in it in some way, shape or form, you know, whether yeah. it be covers, interiors. I mean, he, he's still great to this day. It's actually funny how many guys that had really big, great art styles in the 90s are still doing great covers today. I mean, even yeah. Rob is still bump, pumping out covers today. Um, yeah, that's cool. So, so you mentioned how you were, you know, you've been around comics you know all this time yep. from doing documentaries to to writing and and reading obviously hmm. um but as i look through kind of your like uh bibliography or whatnot you wrote a comic called last born yeah around the 2014 era yeah and yeah then you kind of your next comic credit is is now siphon um, yeah what's it how have you changed like as a person as a writer as a creative hmm. from then to kind of now well i think that um a big project that I did in the interim was a, a horror feature called House of Demons, which was kind of a very influenced by like Vertigo mm -hmm. books and things like that and trying to bring that to a, a kind of, you know, horror film venue. And, and I think that was a very like informative and, and you know, great experience. I, I think with the Last Born and House of Demons were both very uh, like complicated stories. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, some people really got them and enjoyed them. And I think some people found them a little bit hard, you know, or a little hard not to crack. Yeah. And then I think with this book, I've really tried to make it, uh, you know, have those layers and have that complexity, but be more direct and be, you know, a premise that can kind of really engage you and then take you on a ride. Um, but I, I'm, I'm super proud of Last Born, and especially Eric Zawadzki, the artist, has gone on to re do a ton of other stuff. He's worked on Skybound books. He's working on a um, trilogy of like young adult um, Krypton set books for uh, yeah, DC yeah, now. Him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so he, he's been really successful, and, and the book's coming out in trade at some point uh, later this year from Black Mask. So I'm really excited about that because I think we – came out at a time kind of like after the initial wave of black mask, but before it kind of became a, a bigger mm -hmm. to do. So I think we kind of like got lost in this lull. So I'm hoping that when the trade comes out, it'll, it'll get looked at a little bit more and kind of get reassessed as, you know, a fresh thing. Cause I, I think it is a really cool book um, and I'm really proud of it and, and proud of what Eric did on it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's just, you know, I, I think we're all like, where did the time go? It doesn't feel like it was that long ago, but um it's nice to to have the opportunity, especially after doing lower budget film stuff, to really kind of go nuts. Um, you know, like for me with comics, I always like it to be something uh, like a big story because I think you know, uh, there's nothing wrong with like slice of life comics, but I, I don't really like when you're a comic that's a lot of you know people sitting in a room talking and it's the <laughs> same exact panel or whatever. Because I'm like, you can do anything. Like you know, you can really represent it in, in unique ways and do it very visually. So I think for me as somebody who, who has, you know, directed films, I always try to think in like a visual storytelling sense. And I think with this book, you know, especially with Jeff, it was about once I saw how strong he was, I was like, let me give him stuff to do. And, and talking with Mosin about like, how can we make this um, story, you know, come across as visually as possible and make it as, you know, contained in character, but have a scope, have cool stuff, you know, have things to look at that are, are going to really like, you know, grab you. And and I think with the John Kalis, the colorist who works on um, a lot of DC stuff, he's, you know, colored literally like thousands of books. He does an amazing job. Um, and we talked a lot with him about with these powers and perceptions mm -hmm. and things, how we want it to look of just making it look like, you know, kind of like the whole book's like lit by like a neon light yeah, you know, and yeah, it kind yeah. of pops off the page um so that's that's very important to me i think you know uh, as a writer of comics some people you know especially people who are newer to the medium i think write from like a prose point of view where it's mm -hmm. like i'm focused only on dialogue and not thinking about the, the visual storytelling so for me i'm always like i, I want to think about a visual way to tell the story and then kind of let Jeff do his thing and not like micromanage him and just let him because he's gonna you know think about it he's he's gonna bring us something really cool I love how passionate you are about the project mm. now, obviously that's what comes with the territory of creator owned obviously you have a stake in it and everything yep. um but let me ask you before I let you go um 
How long was Siphon in the making? I know I talked to some creators that they say, you know, mm -hmm. five to six years. Sometimes it's yeah. literally was it, it the thought came and they just started going. But how long had yeah. you had the story brewing? Uh, it's been about two years. So it, it took a little bit. Um, I think I first met Mosin um, at Sundance Film Festival, actually. And we, we kind of hit it off and we were both talking about comics. And, um, you know, he was saying he had wanted to do something and he had this idea. And I was like, oh, this, this sounds like a really fun thing. Let's try to work on this together. Um, and, you know, it, it just it always takes a little bit. It, it takes a while to draw it and, you know, to, to be sure you're ahead. But I, I think it, you know, came together at the right time. And, and I'm really excited about it now and, and glad that it's out. And I, I, we're hoping that, uh, you know, hopefully we can do a second one and just, just ride right into it and, and keep, keep the momentum going and, you know, let, let enough time that we can have it in the can and have it, you know, the, the issues done and then start soliciting and, you know, uh, be ready to go. Heck yeah, man. I mean, we're, we're excited. I can't wait for people to, uh, I'm going to take it home tonight and read it. Shh, don't tell anybody, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm excited to get people, uh, the books in their hands on Wednesday and see what the reception is. And, uh, three issue again, you know, three issue miniseries, I think is great for comic book stores because, uh, mm. I, we do a return policy. So anybody who buys siphon number one here, if yeah. for whatever reason they don't like it, they can bring it back, but that gives okay. them, the chance, they, you know, they take the chance on it. And yeah, then the when it's a mini series, so many more people are likely to say, "All right, you know, I'm going to see what he's got for issue two. And then by the time you got him on issue two, it's like you're oh. almost there. So yeah, just <laughs> just go the distance. Um, yeah. I would agree. So yeah, that's awesome. I mean, thank you so much for for you know helping get the book out there. And um, it, it's you know it's it's always exciting to to have the story come out there. And I think I'm I'm really proud of the way it turned out. And I feel like it's a book I could kind of put in anybody's hands and they would enjoy it, hopefully, or, or you know, enjoy reading it, enjoy the art, and um, hopefully say what's going to happen in the next one and, and come back next time. Because we have, um, you know, just to, to tease a little bit, the 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 later issues, I go even bigger visually and, and are even kind of more intense, um, you know, emotionally. So I, I think oh, nice. hopefully it'll be a nice fusion. And we have some cool... Uh, you know, some, some pretty cool stuff coming up, I think. And we're, we're basically wrapping up uh, issue three now, so that will, will be done, you know, with enough time for uh, it to get printed and colored and what have you, so. Nice, nice. And so uh, the book is Siphon number one. Patrick here is uh, the writer, or one, one of the writers. You got some yep. help there. Um, yep. Let the people know where they can, are you on social media? Where can they find you if they want to follow along with your journeys? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm on Twitter and it's just my name, uh, Patrick Meany. And Instagram, I believe is my name, but honestly, let me double check. Because it <laughs> might, I know my, it is uh, Patrick M. Meany. So it's with the, the middle initial M there. Um, and yeah, you can keep up. Uh, so in addition to Siphon, I'm actually in the middle of shooting a new movie now. So today is our off day and we have another week or so to go. So it's, it's a pretty crazy, uh, exciting time. Uh, you're a to, busy guy, man. You get yes. sleep. You occasionally sleep, right? Yes. So that, uh, today was the day of a nice relax. Um, but it, it's great. It's a great, uh, really exciting to have all this stuff going on and, and really excited to, um, you know, it, it was cool. As, as I said before, I got the first issues today, so I was flipping through them and it, it's cool to see it in print. Exactly, man. And, and it's awesome to see everything with you come kind of full circle. You know, mm. you did the documentaries, you were working with guys like Grant and Neil, and you got to interview awesome people. And now you kind of got this book that is showing up on key apps. And mm. it, it, it's a lot of people are talking about it, you know, which is nice for a Top Cow book, it's yeah. like the creator owned book. Um, so man, uh, the guys, the book is siphon number one, it's going to be in any comic store uh, on the 21st, this upcoming Wednesday. Grab it if you can. We will have plenty of copies here at the collective. And uh, Patrick, man, thank you so much for your time. I know you're busy in between the sets and everything like that. So thank you so much. And uh, oh, no, I'm happy to be here. Happy to talk about the book. It's exciting now. That it's finally out. You can actually uh, talk to people about it. So it's it's, uh, it's cool. I can't wait to see how it goes for the three issues. And like I said, uh, if I get a chance, I'll try to bring you back at the end so that you can. Oh, I would love to. People that, about that it. would be great. Cool. Uh, anytime. So cool. Take it easy, Pat. You have a good one, man. Enjoy the rest of your week. Cool. You too. So that was Patrick Miani, who is the writer of Siphon Number One. It's going to be Siphon One, Two, and Three coming out over the next couple months here at all comic stores. We will have them here at the Collective. Um, if I'm feeling froggy, I might see if Patrick's willing to sign a couple copies. But Wednesday, I will have copies all throughout the store. 
And uh, thank you for joining us again. Another great creator-owned interview. Another great episode of Collective Spotlight. Special thanks to Patrick. I hope him and Jeff have a great time with this book. And uh, thank you for joining me. We will do our auction here 5.30 on Wednesday. And then I will be back next week with another great guest. Thanks for